Good evening. Uh, good evening to you, and for those that do not look familiar, welcome to the Graduate School of Design. Uh, I'm Alex Krieger, and my capacity as chair of the Department of Urban Planning and Design it is my pleasure to introduce uh, uh, Richard Burdett, uh, who is the Centennial Professor in Architecture and Urbanism and the Director of the Cities and the Urban Age Program at the London School of Economics. Now, that sounds impressive enough, <laughs> and I could almost stop there, but it hardly encapsulates uh, Richard's many involvements and engagements with uh, uh, contemporary urbanism. Uh, the list of these engagements and contributions is, of course, far too long to recite, but some deserve mention. Uh, 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 Professor Burdett is the chief advisor on architecture and urbanism uh, for the 2012 London Olympics. Uh, he has been the architecture advisor to the mayor of London for most of this decade. Uh, he was a director of the 2006 uh, Biennale in Venice. He's uh, 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 an architecture advisor to the city of Genoa. He was the chairman of the 2007 Mies van der Rohe Prize, and I can keep going uh, with this list. Uh, but even such a list, if I were to continue, does not adequately uh, describe Richard's uh, engagements with urbanism. Uh, as we enter our urban age, uh, that being the name of this ongoing global research project, uh, one actually can think of very few people uh, who are making us more aware of or more alert to what an urban age might mean for us and actually the challenges that we'll have to face uh, in confronting this urban age and making sure that it becomes, uh, well, more humane and uh, less consumptive and more sustainable. Uh, and perhaps even more equitable, as opposed to just more crowded and more sort of full of frictions. Now, I'm sure that you have all seen, and if not, shame on you, I'm sure that you've all seen uh, Richard's The Endless City, first published in 2007, which in part is a comparative study of uh, six of the most dynamic uh, uh, world sort of capitals. Uh, London being, of course, Richard's home uh, town, uh, New York, Shanghai, Berlin, uh, Mexico City, and Johannesburg. And the book is an incredible compilation, both of data uh, as well as, of course, great insight. By the way, my own uh, favorite statistic about uh, the uh, rather staggering urbanization that's taking place around the world uh, is the following. Uh, it took a century for approximately 27 million people to emigrate from Europe to the United States uh, between around 19, 1850 and 1950 or so, and that was considered one of the great human migrations uh, up until that time. Every single year, approximately that many people migrate from rural China to uh, urban China. Uh, so in the endless city, uh, both Richard's sort of breadth of understanding about the dynamics of urbanization, uh, as well as his commitment to uh, find ways for us to better plan and design it, more wisely plan and design them. Uh, the book is full of these things, and so with that alone, uh, it is my pleasure again to introduce uh, Richard Burdett and to listen to him. Thank you, Alex, and it's um, a great honor to be at GSD again, uh, seeing friendly faces, and I have to obviously uh, start with Moisen, who uh, uh, introduced me to my wife. So, you know, this is uh, uh, a canonical moment for me to be able to come back and uh, uh, pay my gratitude. Um, I uh, would like to um, talk in this hour about the work that um, we collectively, uh, Alex has sort of singled me out for a, a number of Im important jobs and activities, but we collectively at the LSE with colleagues who are also here from other parts of the world have been doing uh, over the last four or five years. Uh, and I thought I would also um, maybe uh, risk getting my hands uh, dirty uh, by sharing with you some of the conclusions or some of the thoughts anyway now in London uh, in terms of what is happening to uh, the site, which is the site for the London 2012 Olympics, which is where I will end. And I've um, in, in, entitled this talk slightly provocatively, you know, understanding cities in a global age, does design matter? I mean, to actually ask that question here at the Graduate School of Design is a bit risky. Uh, 
Uh, but I, I think one has to ask that question and remind ourselves, those of us who are involved in the making of uh, the built environment, uh, remind ourselves that the making of the physical fabric, uh, the creation of quality, has massive impacts on people's lives and on the environmental agenda. And that's really all I want to talk about and give examples. And I have to say, for once, positive examples, uh, which I am beginning to see around the world of things which are happening on the ground, which are making places better. And they're design-led initiatives. In many ways, I will be provoking a discussion, perhaps, with you as to the definition of design. Uh, what constitutes design? Does actually designing a governance system, uh, as I've learned from Jerry Frug, uh, constitute a piece of design that an architect or an urbanist should be involved in? The answer is absolutely yes. Uh, does designing a transit system um, go outside the remit of an architect or an urban designer? Absolutely no. It's something that uh, is totally endemic to uh, the making of sustainable and livable cities. So those are the sorts of issues that I want to talk to you about. What I'd like to do, if possible, is have the house lights down and just focus uh, on the projector. Uh, thanks. Now, many of you in this room know this slide extremely well, but I think it's important to just remind ourselves of where we are in time, not just because two years ago the United Nations uh, confirmed that half the world's population uh, is uh, living in cities, uh, but just to look back and look forward. Just look at that statistics, interestingly paralleling what uh, Alex was saying a moment ago about migration. Uh, look at that statistic, and, and only 110 years ago, a tiny percentage of the world was living uh, in cities. The rest were living in sort of agrarian or rural environments. And the trend, if it continues the way it is, and in fact, it's very likely to, if not, to, uh, might exceed it, is that in uh, 40 years' time, so when my son will be just a little bit older than I am, uh, we will have three quarters of the world's population living in cities. So the question is for all of us, what is the shape of this? What are we actually doing in terms of designing it? How are we making it? How are we governing that space to make it uh, in many ways more sustainable? Uh, one of my colleagues at the London School of Economics, Nick Stern, an expert on uh, the economics of climate change is absolutely convinced that climate change uh, impact will accelerate urbanization because of what he calls climate change refugees. That people are leaving deserts, leaving areas that they can no longer sustain themselves and move into cities, which of course many of them, particularly the coastal ones, are most at risk because of other climate change threats. So there's this interesting conundrum. And if there are two things that I in a way would like to uh, leave with you, but um, uh, provide a context to what I'm talking about, is uh, these two very, very simple statistics. One is to do with the social, and the other one is to do with the environmental. A third of people today who live in cities live in slums of one sort or another. If 75% of the world's population are going to move into cities in the next 30, 40 years, and that number remains the same, it is a massive number that few of us can imagine what that means. And the second key issue is that 75% of uh, world energy is consumed one way by buildings and transport associated with cities, and therefore 75% of uh, CO2 emissions is affected by cities. So a small impact on these numbers will make an enormous difference. And I guess the key argument is that design is part of that discussion. Now, again, I apologize if some of you have seen this image before, but if, even if you half close your eyes, you all think you've seen this image before. It could be a photograph from the air of practically any emerging city anywhere in the world, whether South America, it happens to be Caracas in Venezuela, but it could be parts of Lagos, it could be parts of uh, uh, the fringes of um, the Pacific uh, Rim, not China, though, because of what you see on the left. And I use the slide for a very, very simple um, reason to, in a way, engage uh, with you uh, as to what the issues are in terms of those statistics that we saw before. And why do I say that? Here on the right, you see, on the whole, what architects do. Clearly not those trained at GSD. Clearly not. But everywhere else, architects are trained to build uh, point block buildings on the whole whose interests literally end at the property line of the, of the owner around them. That's where it stops. And that's what 95% of 
architecture in the world, I think, is unfortunately like. In the middle, you see what transport planners, and there's no criticism to any transport planners in the room, tend to do. They need to move people very fast and very efficiently from A to B. But with little uh, awareness, and I don't need to say this in this city, having spent a wonderful morning with uh, Eric looking at what I must say is an extraordinary project, the Big Dig. It is absolutely amazing what you've done. And I know there's a lot of debate as to whether it's done well and whether it's working for the city. But just stand back and the fact that you created a space which over the next 10, 20, 30, 40 years will become again the public realm of the city, I think is extraordinary. This cannot happen here. And these are the issues that matter. Now, on the left of the slide is what is not familiar to many of us, certainly in the global north, but absolutely standard in the global south and elsewhere, which is what people do, which is create uh, areas of informal housing, barrios, favelas, whatever you may want to call them, uh, which have very little basic infrastructure as we uh, can understand. And I think one of the themes, one of the challenges for a school like this one um, is to understand, well, what can we do to help here? And I think there's a lot of interesting work beginning uh, to happen. I was at the Rotterdam Biennale just a, a week ago, and it's all about this theme. And a lot of the interesting projects are beginning to come out of that. But I think, on the other hand, we have to recognize that most of the outputs, and this is perhaps unfair, but I think true, of institutions like Harvard, like MIT, like London School of Economics, um, like many of the great schools of architecture and design and planning, many of the sort of outputs that we dump on the emerging world are more to do with this world than anything else. And I think a lot of the models, the three-dimensional models uh, that we propose in terms of planning, uh, if we work for consultancies, and trained uh, in uh, the West are extremely negative examples of what uh, should be done. And I think that's uh, an issue for a certainly moral discussion uh, um, which needs to be at the heart of any school of design or governance. Now, again, an image which is perhaps by now uh, so familiar that it's self-evident what this is saying. But if, as I contend that design is central to the creation of social sustainability in cities, of creating social equity. This probably summarizes it better than anything else. What you see here is the um, uh, favelas in São Paulo of uh, uh, Pariasopolis, which has been there for 30, 40 years. It has its own dynamics, but it lacks two things, uh, basic water and basic forms of sewage. It just doesn't have that. When it rains, the place floods, um, and s some of the streets, in fact, disappear. On the right, behind this wall, is a recent tower block where the wealth of the individuals here means that each terrace has a swimming pool. Uh, it's that level of distinction. Now, it would be naive to sit here and say that this is sort of unacceptable, that two worlds uh, like this actually uh, clash with each other. All cities, particularly in cities where there's a growing economy, will always have face this sort of conflict between the two. But not all cities need to create a wall which even when this group of people raise up in terms of their aspirations and status, uh, will never be able to connect with uh, what is on the right-hand side. So in many ways, I think the design of the environment, of the ground floor plane, of the potential connectivity between the left and the right-hand part of the slide is what I want to talk about. On the environmental side, if the f that image I've just showed you of some Paolo summarizes to me the so social exclusion argument. On uh, the environmental side, Mexico City perhaps uh, best illustrates one of our problems today. When this picture was taken only a few years ago, uh, the city happened to end over here. We are about 25 miles away from the city center. Uh, the distance you need to travel to these areas to actually get to work may be anything between three and four hours if you take a bus. In fact, it's probably faster by car. This is a city which still today has something like seven, eight hundred new cars on the roads every day. Uh, and it's continuing to sprawl, a bit less dramatic than it was a few years ago. Now, what I think is important uh, in terms of the design agenda to understand is how sprawl affects the environmental equation. Not only does it affect it in terms of the obvious issue I've uh, talked about, which is uh, it increases travel distances and uh, the th more thinly a city spreads, the more unlikely it is that you can sustain a public transport system. Uh, 
and uh, therefore uh, more and more people use cars. There's no other way of getting uh, to your place of work. But it also stretches literally uh, the basic infrastructure, whether it's lighting, whether it's sewers or anything else. So the costs of this growth are enormous. Now, there are many models in the United States, Portland, Oregon, Seattle, of course, London with the green belt of urban containment boundaries. And I think these sorts of lessons need to be thought about and understood better because it's exactly these problems that we faced in the West, in the global North, in cities like London, cities like New York, cities like uh, Barcelona, Madrid, which were growing very, very rapidly, not as rapidly as the, um, the rates that we are facing now, over 100, 120 years ago. And there are very clear lessons to learn which I think are not being implemented. And some of the lessons are clear. They're uh, for us to see. I hope it's okay in Boston to show the picture of another uh, American city, but the mere notion of creating Central Park and uh, creating a possibility of th this extraordinary density around it, which sort of serves um, a whole range of people on the west and east uh, and north and south, but with this lung at the center is an alternative way of doing it. And these are exactly the issues, and I want to conclude with this when I talk about the London Olympics that we're grappling with in London. So perhaps a core part of my argument is to say where, uh, what they were talking about doesn't just apply to the favelas of Rio, doesn't just apply to, uh, doesn't just apply to the emerging cities of um, the Asian subcontinent, but also some of the core themes apply to the decisions we're taking today as planners and um, civic leaders. Now, we are reminded that cities exist for very, very simple uh, reasons. They're about the flows of capital, of people, and goods. Uh, ultimately, uh, the connections between cities will always, and I think undoubtedly, uh, mean that they will continue to grow. It's very unlikely that one will stop growth in cities. Uh, however much there is a discussion that maybe that's the only solution to make the world more sustainable. People will continue to come to cities to get jobs. Uh, people will continue to come to cities in order to uh, interact with each other. And uh, what has been happening is that the cities have been growing, and I'll show you uh, a bit more about that in a second, in those regions of the world which, of course, at one level are poorest, but also have uh, the greatest potential. What you see here in the dark speckles is the greatest concentration of uh, larger cities in the world. And while uh, clearly um, Europe, sorry, not larger cities, that's wrong, largest concentration of, of uh, human footprint in the world, it's interesting how uh, empty quite a lot of the United States is. Uh, you wonder where people are in Ireland or Spain, um, but uh, you know this is what's happening. That's the reality uh, of uh, density of population on the face of the earth. And the statistics of uh, this rate, as Alex has already um, uh, intimated with his uh, uh, numbers, uh, are really quite something that we've never understood. So design needs not only to cope with a, a, a problem of how to deal with a large quantity, but also the speed of change. These are the numbers of people moving into various cities like Lagos, like Mumbai, like uh, Dakar, not per day, but per hour. So for every minute that I speak, one new person has moved into Lagos. Now that's the rate of change that we're talking about. Some of these will slow down, some of these will increase over time. So dealing with that uh, range is what the project, the um, urban age, has been uh, sort of focusing on for some time. Without going into this in any detail, these are the cities that we've been uh, studying. Alex has already mentioned the work that is summarized in the first uh, publication, which came out a year and a half ago. Um, but what is interesting from this is that uh, over the last century, cities um, like London and New York, as I mentioned before, grew dramatically, but then dipped and dropped really quite, quite a lot. I mean, New York and London lost three or four million people between the Second World War and the 80s and 90s, and they're beginning to actually grow again. In fact, London and New York are going to reach eight million from 7.2 million uh, in the next decade. But this is nothing compared to Shanghai, Istanbul, and Mumbai. If Mumbai continues to grow like this, it will continue and overtake Tokyo, which still today is the largest city in the world at 36 million. The question for us is if Mumbai continues to grow in the state that it is now, with half its population without sewers or water, and it becomes a city in 20, 30 years with whatever it is, 35 million people, what is 
sort of condition are we actually creating for the next generation of urban dwellers? Certainly not the sort of conditions that uh, we have been able to produce for ourselves. What I mentioned before is that cities will continue forever, I think, to attract uh, growth. And it's very simple, and it reflects the world economy uh, and um, the value and the uh, of production, sorry, and the value of um, uh, agricultural goods. This young man who sells peanuts and cigarettes at the traffic lights of Mexico City makes three times more money by doing this than working in the fields. Uh, and I think as long as that situation is uh, going to uh, continue to happen, it is unlikely that urbanization and the rate of urbanization will change. I was always struck by the wonderful uh, words of Suketu Mehta, who wrote uh, a documentary book on the experience of Mumbai, uh, where he describes um, this massive, wonderful, uh, crazy, dynamic city um, he uses the word that most people who come in as migrants describe it, which is Mumbai is like a bird of gold because it represents promise, because it, pre re it represents the idea that you come in as a young man and you have the opportunity of sort of moving up in life. And I think this is what this guy actually feels. This is why these people who are the illegal street vendors in Mexico City are doing. This is, they come in because that's their possibility and their hope. But they also are the ones who not only work informally, as we just saw, but also build informally. And uh, some of the work we've been doing compares, in fact, the, um, the informal economy of different nations, for example, uh, uh, Mumbai on the left in relation to the nation. And you actually see how high the informal sector is in all these cities. So in Mumbai, nearly, uh, I can't read it, 68%. In Delhi, 67%. In Mexico City, just about 50% is where the informal sector and therefore informal housing um, actually uh, affects everything. So I think for us as designers, we need to understand how to operate in the informal and not just deal with the formal top-down planning mechanisms. Now, I mentioned that one uh, would look at the growth of cities over time, and just very, very quickly, I want to uh, show you, if you look at the map up there, the number up there, 1950, and look at the cities uh, which, in blue, blue dots, uh, had one million people over the last um, 50 years, just see where they are at the moment. There are obviously a cluster of them in Europe and some on the East Coast, uh, very few in South America, and one or two over here on the East Coast. 1975, a growth which concentrates uh, in Asia Pacific. 2000, and a few years ago, you see how many are in Africa, uh, other parts of South America. But the growth, by far the greatest growth of cities uh, over a million will be in these regions here, which are A, poorer, and B, I'll come back to that, uh, areas which at the moment use relatively low energy per capita. So in that sense, I think there's a potential and a promise rather than a sort of negative implication. We can look at the same statistics a slightly different way. These are just showing you in yellow uh, the size of buildings like New York or London in 1950. There we go, 1960, they're growing. Tokyo shooting up on the right-hand side, 2000. But more importantly, in the next uh, sort of six, seven years, according to the UN, this is where the growth is going to concentrate. And clearly, I'll be coming back to that in a moment. Now, the question becomes, in terms of design and in terms of understanding of the relationship between the physical and the social. What is happening as these cities grow? What is happening to the spaces that we create uh, and uh, to uh, the people who inhabit the spaces that are created uh, by uh, the design community across the world? This is Shanghai, uh, a city studied incredibly well uh, here by Peter Rowe uh, and others at GSD and many other institutions. These are the statistics, just to remind ourselves of what we're talking about. I mean, in 1980, it was only uh, 100, there were only 121 buildings above eight stories. Now it's over 10,000. And what is driving this? It's very important to remind ourselves. It's not just demographic change. It's not just growth, uh, because um, that doesn't actually explain it. It's the uh, really unacceptable conditions that an economy which is growing so fast, a sort of proto- uh, or neo-capitalist economy, one might call it, uh, <coughs> uh, trying to sort of create the conditions uh, which 
are unacceptable in here because many of these places have uh, no running water and no heating and certainly no uh, ventilation or air conditioning, and moving to places like that. Now, of course, in the Chinese context, this happens by fiat, by political uh, uh, decision-making. So what um, is happening is that a large population who used to live in a very, very confined area, in fact, every individual in 1990 in Shanghai had an average, occupied an average of um, three square meters. That's the size of a small car, let's say, every individual. That number has actually quadrupled in 15 years because of the new facility. So the need is to absolutely just create more space uh, and better space. But is this better space? I mean, we're concerned, of course, with creating better facilities and resources internally. But many of the new environments, I have to say, are designed with this sort. I do not see these places, of which there are many. This could be Istanbul. This could be the uh, municipal new housing built uh, uh, in, by the government in Istanbul. It could be parts of, um, uh, in fact, even uh, many South American cities that we've been studying. I do not see how any of this, over time, has the com potential to create the sort of complexity uh, and overlapping of different uses and mixes and integration which create cities as we know them. And transport clearly becomes part of that agenda. I totally accept, we all totally accept that cities need to uh, be provided with uh, high levels of public transport um, infrastructure in order for them to work. Shanghai is extraordinary in terms of the investment uh, it is making uh, at the moment in terms of increasing the number of uh, underground lines and the um, investment in new stations. In fact, I've only learned recently that China is investing 400 billion pounds in public transport, the United States about 20 billion at the moment. That may change. That's th the nature of the statistics that face us. But let's just think what is happening. China, to, uh, sorry, Shanghai today has still 9 million bicycles. And we know that there is a tendency, even in New York, for heaven's sakes, for people to start using bicycles. When you go to Shanghai now, many of you will know, there are some streets which say no cycles. Why? Because the cycles cause congestion. To whom? The cars. So it's quite an extraordinary sort of cycle of also decision-making here, which ref reflects totally different interests uh, within the city's sort of uh, decision-making process. Now, in India, I think, is one of the cities where the change is taking on uh, very dramatic proportions, and some of it driven because of its poverty uh, by the investment of international organizations. I think that in the United States, where the World Bank uh, and uh, the IMF uh, are such critical players, these lessons really need to be understood better. Uh, one of the projects which uh, we witness is to do with the relocation of some of the slum housing next to um, a railway um, widening uh, program. And what struck me about the, this project is the following. In seeing this slum from the air, this is not Dharavi, it's another slum to the north and east of um, uh, that central area. Uh, this slum, when seen from the air, has a sort of configuration that one recognizes. Uh, dense pattern of streets with very low quality conditions of living, but a vibrant life. People make their living. Uh, in these neighborhoods. Our eye was struck by this here. And uh, only because we then went to see what it was that we realized. But when you look at it at this distance from the back of the room, I presume you might think this is some sort of um, oil depot or some uh, form of... Um, uh, oops, well, we've jumped already. Some form of sort of um, industrial unit. No, it's new housing built three and a half years ago with money from the World Bank. And because it's housing for the individuals that we saw who lived in those slums, who were relocated, the standards of this housing, let me stress, built three, three and a half years ago, the standards for lighting and actually distances uh, between the buildings is lower than the national requirement because it is housing for the relocated people. Now, the conditions here, you can just imagine what it's like. Um, uh, the ventilation and with the heat that you have in Mumbai is such that people actually can't live in, these, in the buildings themselves. Uh, they don't have the money to pay for the use of the elevators and to support uh, the electricity for that. Therefore, the elevators are no longer used. They're used for garbage. Uh, they just throw their garbage in it. Uh, 
As a result, they're infested with rats. And you know, you've created over, in three years, you've created a sort of a, a vertical slum rather than a horizontal one. With actually uh, very little that you can do with this. It becomes a sort of fixed asset. So taking the negative sign of this design matter, yes, it absolutely does when this is what you actually do. Now, I don't know who designed it, but an architect was involved in that project. Now, as I said before, this is not just a problem for them, for those on the other side of the world. It's a problem which I think also affects um, some of the more advanced and apparently even more balanced urban uh, economies like Paris. Central Paris, of course, in many ways is the picture postcard of what ideal urban living is. But the edges of the city are like this, the banlieue, the uh, sort of lost neighborhoods of uh, the last 20, 30 years, which are uh, intriguing because they have something, one thing in common. This is very different from other cities that I know, including London. What is typical of uh, Paris is that the whole of the area outside the peripherique, the edge of the city, has one typology. It's one form of building which is inhabited, and here I am generalizing, by generally one social group and largely of one ethnic uh, uh, background. Now, it is one of the reasons why the riots have happened in Paris. This is through the work done by Sophie bondi Gendreau, one of our, the sociologists working on urban age, clearly identified the spatial dynamic uh, as one of the reasons that caused the sense of disenfranchisement uh, and then the eruption of violence in the cities over time. And I have to say, if there's one thing that uh, the Urban Age project has looked at and understood over the last five or six years, is the emerging uh, reality of a city of walls. I'm stealing this title from Jerry Frug, uh, who writes about it at a sort of even a, at a political level. But literally, what is, one is seeing, this happens to be Johannesburg, uh, is the emerging city of difference, of fragmentation, a city of boundaries, where people from different social groups hide behind uh, literally walls. Now, you could argue, and I think one has to argue in Johannesburg, this is necessary. The level of violence uh, in a city 15 years after apartheid is unfortunate and depressing, but it is real. Um, so what is happening is that people are moving out of the city centers and building themselves uh, housing behind walls which have to be extended uh, after two years uh, with barbed wire and everything else in order to make them even more um, secure. The effect of that is this sense of fear, is that no one walks. The effect of that is the local authority, the mayor says, why should I pay for pavements? The effect of that is that there will not be a city which has the potential of reuniting itself, of reconnecting the, so the social and uh, the, the physical as many other cities have had in the past. So I think that for me is really a critical uh, point to make, that design really matters even at that micro level when decisions are made to get rid of the pavements. Now, the sort of envi environments that one can imagine, this happens to be um, in, in India, but I mean, it could be anywhere. The emerging notion of the gated community, in some cases, absolutely is needed. Much as I don't like it, if I were bringing up my kids in Mexico City or Sao Paulo today, I probably would be living in a gated community uh, uh, because I wouldn't want my kid kidnapped uh, uh, on the street or, uh, or me being stopped and shot at, um, uh, which is very likely to happen. Uh, what is odd and difficult to understand, and I certainly don't have an answer to that, is that when you go to Istanbul, which has one of the lowest uh, rates of crime anywhere in the world, it's um, one fifteenth of what it is in Philadelphia, and Tony Williams, ex-mayor of um, Washington, will tell me it's probably something similar to that compared to your city. Why these uh, emerging neighborhoods, which is where the middle classes are living, use exactly the same typology of the gated community, um, even though there is no violence? It's all to do, of course, with a sort of sense of branding, a sense of identity, of bringing together people of a similar um, uh, uh, intention, a similar skin in some cases, uh, all together in a sort of safe environment. This is not city. And I think Richard Sennett has written very eloquently about it. So one of the issues that I think we need to understand is whether the emerging world of you know, wonderful, creative uh, architecture like Zaha Hadid's Kartal project or her recent new project in Cairo, which I think she's... Uh, 
recently won for a new neighborhood, ends up having the same, let's call it negative qualities of um, some of these gated communities or can actually overtake that and create a more integrated environment at the physical level which allows this sort of social integration over time. Now, this is why, of course, we've studied, as you have uh, here at GSD um, and in all your departments, the actual fabric of the city, the ground plane. And I think we need to recapture this as a design discipline. I mean, I think this can't be left, as some people say, it's too important to be left to planners. It's not that's unkind, but it's too important to be left to planners or politicians who don't understand the three-dimensional implications of decisions uh, of this sort in terms of the fabric of the city. So that we're beginning to actually work in establishing uh, typologies of non-inclusive uh, spaces without going into too much detail here, and instead looking at which are the forms of the city, uh, the shapes of the buildings, and the way they relate uh, to the plan and the section of their environs, which actually prove much more resilient. Uh, Hashim Sarkis a few years ago spoke uh, in New York about the notion of the resilience of a building like uh, a loft space on the Lower East Side. I could use the Georgian House in London. As a, as a building itself, which allows uh, society to change from in, uh, inhabitation, let's say in the London example, for middle class families in the mid 18th century, to then sort of student flats, and then now to uh, yuppie housing for people with BMWs parked outside. Society has changed, but the buildings have remained the same. And that has an enormous amount to do with understanding the sort of flexibility of the build form and I think essentially how it meets the ground. Now let me talk a little bit about the energy issue before going into some of the more concrete examples of um, design and urban change which I referred to at the beginning. I've already um, mentioned that if you look at energy cons consumption per capita and uh, see this map that the darker color shows uh, the higher consumption per capita and no surprise United States, in fact, Australia and parts of Russia are at the higher end of consumption per capita uh, than elsewhere. What is interesting from here, if you remember the image we saw before where there's a clustering of urbanization in Africa, uh, in India, and parts of China, at the moment, these are low uh, energy consuming countries. So what model do they actually choose? Which way do they go in terms of uh, dealing with this equation here? Uh, and here, I think the issue of density becomes incredibly important, work that we've done in trying to understand how efficiently people can actually live close together. And um, just interesting to compare at exactly the same scale. There's 7 million people uh, living in New York uh, with the population density that you can see over there. There's the same number of people actually living in London. You know, there's a long way to go before we get overcrowded in London. This is you know, nothing in comparison to uh, central Shanghai, uh, which doesn't have particularly uh, tall buildings uh, yet. But um, I want to just use one rather uh, difficult graph that may be familiar to some of you in the room, which is just a graph which, uh, from a report done many years ago, which uh, looks at the density in relation to um, um, use of gasoline. In other words, what is, uh, it, it just confirms that the most efficient place in the world is Hong Kong. Uh, and um, you see then the densest cities like uh, Tokyo, Singapore, etc. at this end of the scale. And, oops, and let me go back. And uh, let's call it the unhappy examples, many of them are in this country, uh, are the most uh, spread out cities. Now, I think that correlation needs to be understood and studied very, very carefully in terms of the lessons we actually pass on and the policies we uh, uh, we suggest um, to other countries which are dealing with this issue. Just a quick comparison before I move on. This is uh, Mumbai's metro region, which has roughly 18 million people. And look at the density of inhabitation here. This is London's metro region, what we call the southeast of England, much, much sparser in terms of its um, uh, um, uh, habitation. And if you look at, there are really two extremes of um, um, modal splits of use of different forms of transport when you compare these two. You have over, um, in fact, 50% of people walk to work uh, or uh, cycle to work in Mumbai. Uh, in London, actually quite a large number of people fortunately use public transport. 
uh, nearly 40% all over all. But is there something about the efficiency in the system of Mumbai that needs to be maintained? Or does the, the model of the city which is being proposed for the future need to make it more car dependent? Now here we uh, begin to come to one of the key debates, uh, one of the key debates of course being addressed next uh, in a month or and a half from now at the Copenhagen Climate Change Conference as to whether uh, freedom of development and economic development needs to actually create more consumption and therefore produce more CO2 emissions. And the models which are always used, well, if America can do it, why can't we? I mean, broadly speaking, that's what is used. And I think um, the argument that um, the American city uh, needs to be car-driven in order to be successful is something that I think uh, needs to be debated. Sorry, not the American city, the, the um, modern city. Because if you just compare Tokyo, which I've already mentioned, still today the largest city in the world, nearly 80% of the population use a fantastic system, high with great investment over the years, um, uh, of uh, nearly 80% spend less than one hour actually to get to work using the trains, the underground, and the buses. In LA, in the city, it's um, roughly 80%, and it gets worse when you go out in terms of the county. Uh, I'm actually told recently that uh, the car ownership is one and a half uh, persons per, uh, cars per person in LA. It certainly is not that in Tokyo. Imagine what that would actually mean. So where are the positive examples? You know, I've painted a bit of a picture of doom and gloom, but I think it's important to understand uh, what the context is in terms of the decisions uh, we might be able to make. And some of them can be found, in fact, in those areas where, ne where there is greatest need. And one of them is in the city of Bogota. Uh, in fact, a friend of ours of the urban age, the former mayor of the city, Enrique Peñalosa, did a number of really wonderful things together with some of his colleagues. Uh, and that uh, was to deal with a city which is as big as London, 7 million people today, with immense problems of sort of uh, crime, actually a lot of it induced because of the, gang, uh, the, the gangs uh, to do with the cocaine trade in other parts of the country, in, in effect. So this city is a haven. This is where people keep on coming to get away from some of the violence which happens elsewhere. Well, what did this mayor do? The mayor knew that there would be informal development, whatever they said. I've referred to that uh, before. So he actually created a series of cycleways out into the middle of nowhere, or so it seems. 80 kilometers, 50 miles of cycleways, which just take you out to nowhere. And the reason is very simple, because as these uh, informal developments grow and their family members join them from elsewhere, uh, the city envelops these routes. And these routes become the veins, the sort of the infrastructure, cycle-based, not car-based, for the emerging informal city. You look at it, you half close your eyes, well, it looks actually quite regulated, quite organized. And it is really quite civilized when you go and see what it's like. The second thing he did was to introduce public spaces right at the fringes of these developments, well-designed spaces which actually become vibrant. Uh, they become marketplaces uh, uh, during the week, but also build libraries and schools by some of the best architects in the city, and they are wonderful, I've been to them. And the combined effect of this is that these spaces are not remote from where the people who most need them are. Uh, and the effect has been that the literacy rate in Bogota is now the highest of any other city in South America. And I would say it's because of the quality of these spaces and their proximity. It's easy for a kid who lives in the sort of barrio over there to go there in an af afternoon and actually get access to books or a computer and an internet. The um, third thing he did and this is probably best known uh, amongst um, uh, urban uh, uh, students, is the introduction of this system stolen from the mayor of Curitiba, which is the Transmilenio bus, which is a dedicated uh, bus lane, which means that if you live in one of these neighborhoods, uh, you can actually take the bicycle to this uh, stop, uh, put your bicycle in here, and most importantly, and this makes the mayor laugh with absolute pleasure, get into the city far quicker than the guy stuck in the traffic jam. Right? But in a way, that's a sort of very strong political point about public transport being uh, fundamental to uh, providing rights to the people who deserve it and rights to what? To work. 
and I think that is the critical thing that has happened in this city. Uh, I was struck by some of the things we learned in India, where the mayor of New Delhi uh, in a few years was able to actually uh, convert uh, most of the uh, informal uh, little pup putts, as they're called, from uh, polluting uh, p petroleum and, uh, uh, and, other, uh, and, and other sort of diesel into natural gas. And the whole of the bus system in a period of six months was changed from uh, gasoline-based to uh, natural gas. So the pollution levels in that city have dropped dramatically in the space of actually two years. So things are possible, and we are seeing projects on the ground. As I said at the beginning, I consider those decisions design decisions. They're not just decisions for planners and politicians. And I think it's up to our integrated profession to actually put those issues on the table. Other parts of the world, unfortunately, are not following this way. Mexico City, even though things are changing there with a new mayor, uh, a city that has grown you know, dramatically to, uh, after Tokyo, the world's largest city today, decided in the last three years to spend 75% of its transport budget on building a secondo piso, an elevated motorway. I need say nothing in this city. That, that's not a brilliant idea. Uh, and what happens when you build that? Well, it's permanently stuck with traffic uh, because the minute you create a new uh, uh, a route, uh, people will use it and get stuck on it. This is a culture where people love their car sometimes more than their uh, family members. Uh, but what is extraordinary about this city, which I absolutely adore, that it has this magical center. It's a city center which looks like some of the best European towns that many of us have studied over the years. Uh, while the city has continued to grow at the rate I've actually described, the population in this area has dropped by 40%. 40%. So you have a complete lack of use of this extraordinary resource, which is a city center, well served by public transport, wonderful buildings and uh, facilities around it. And the reason is mainly to do with violence. Fear of the middle class is actually living here, and they go out to these really horrific environments, such as the one in Santa Fe. So back to looking at projects and initiatives, which I think really do offer uh, optimism in terms of design solutions. The very first image I showed you of Caracas had on the left-hand side this barrio uh, called Petare. Petare, unfortunately, has one of the world records of violence for teenagers. Uh, drugs, gangs, I've actually been there and been absolutely terrified. It's the only place I've been totally terrified in my life because some of the people you go and meet take out guns to show off. You know, that's the sort of thing to do. Um, and when I was there, I walked around the city and then took this picture. Uh, in the, the tiny little square in the middle of this place and ask these kids, well, what, what, are, what, what are those things? So those are the bullet holes from last weekend's uh, shooting, and the brothers of one of these kids have actually been murdered. Most of the people who are shot and murdered are shot by mistake in crossfire rather than intentionally. I mean, it's one of these extraordinary uh, negative situations, which seems as if it's irresolvable. Perhaps at one level it is. But um, what actually has happened here is that a group of young architects, I think well known to you, the urban think tank uh, group, who I think has also taught here, decided with an, their own initiative to build something called the Vertical Gym. This is a three-story building right in the fringes of this uh, favelas that I just described to you. And what is interesting here is that it's the young men between ages of 16 and 18 who actually use the space, come off the, uh, the street, um, and instead of shooting guns or, sh um, and, or, or shooting themselves with drugs, actually shoot basketballs and, and, and use the gym. Now, the effect, I am told, of this sort of initiative, it can't be on its own, but certainly one of the byproducts is, is that the crime rate has dropped by 35% in this region. And we've also witnessed more recently in Sao Paulo very similar initiatives of, uh, for example, new schools program, which are open... Um, 18 hours a day, so that the kids, after they finish lessons, can actually stay and use the sports hall or use some of the public uh, libraries. So actually keeping kids in public and well-designed spaces, rather than go home where the parents can't afford to be home because they're spending four hours commuting uh, and trying to get work, is, I think, one of the critical issues that needs to be understood and, and, and observed. Medellin in Colombia had the worst crime rate anywhere in the world um, only a few years ago. And um, without going into too much detail, what is extraordinary is that up until very recently, as you see, this crime rate has dropped. 
uh, dramatically over the last seven years. And the mayor, who uh, spoke at one of our conferences, is absolutely adamant that the reason this has happened is that he started a policy of public spaces, parks, and schools right in the middle of the sort of environments I've been describing. Now, you can see they're extremely well designed, they're very civilized, and they create for the people who live in the areas around them, whether they're schools uh, or other facilities, a sense of actually being seen to be important. You provide a space that matters, and people begin to uh, behave in a similar way when you create a school of this quality in the middle of one of those barriers. Uh, Sao Paulo, I'm struck by the quality of some of the work that is being done very much uh, bottom-up with the help of, in fact, the University of Sao Paulo from areas like this, just creating uh, sort of landscape, landscape spaces in the public realm, clearing up uh, open sewers, uh, turning them to sort of, you know, more civic environments which w really do work for the communities who inhabit them. And um, I want to, in a way, conclude this part by talking about two specific projects before uh, trying to wind all this into the example of how we're dealing with similar issues in London and the London Olympics. Um, this is a project in the middle of Sao Paulo which, in fact, received an important award that Tony Williams and I are part of. It's a $100,000 award given by uh, Deutsche Bank uh, connected to the Urban Age program that we do. And every year when we go into a city and hold a conference, Mumbai, Sao Paulo, and next week, um, Istanbul, we actually provide this award. And what this project is, and it goes right to the heart at a micro scale rather than macro scale that I've been talking about of, I think, design and the potential for design, is for uh, the reinvention of what this building is about. This is a typical uh, image that you might find in many uh, South American cities of um, unfinished buildings right at the heart of the city center uh, where people either ran out of money or the politics of the city meant that things could not actually go ahead. And it was um, invaded, as it's called, invasiones, by 300 families who lived in this uh, tower without any uh, facilities at all, no water, no electricity, anything else. Uh, some children used the elevator shafts to actually seep into it. Was that overcrowded? Now, what is interesting about this is that that tall building is right at the heart of the city. It's not where you expect most of the favelas, the poor areas, to be, which are on the fringes of the city, such as the example I showed you a moment ago. Um, and it's actually very close to one of the markets of the city, which is very active and provides jobs to people at the bottom end of the ladder. So what happened is that a group of, from the university, from the School of Architecture, a group of students moved into uh, this uh, environment and started working with the community who's there. They uh, agreed on reducing the number of families actually living there in a matter of six months with the help of the city authorities who relocated them elsewhere. So instead of having 300 families, it's now I think 180, I don't know the exact number. Uh, they started then working with them to raise money to sort of retrofit the building and put in a gas system and water uh, and other things. This is one of the community leaders proudly showing off the fact that they have electricity in it. Simple things like this. This corridor uh, was dark and they made an opening in this wall to bring in light. So in fact, I know this doesn't look very dignified, but actually going to your home instead of being in the dark without lights, but having daylight to it uh, means a lot to the people who live there. But then this happened. Um, a uh, building right in front of uh, this structure was being uh, repainted, an industrial building. So some of the community leaders said, well, why don't we get the guys to come and give us some of their ladders and renders and uh, paint? Let, let's do that. Let's see what happened. And they were able to get them to do this practically for free, but as you can see, only on one side. It didn't really go uh, too far. The rest remained the same. Now, what struck us as sort of a jury on this is that the effect of this facade that's, cool. That's all it is. I'm not pretending it's anything more than that. Is that the family started literally upgrading the interiors. So that because there was this... Uh, so people who, are, as you can see here, this is a very civic environment, who before and six months before this were living in really not very civilized environments, started making this sort of effort uh, to keep the place clean and sort of control what it's like. And they were given uh, this prize of $100,000 uh, to sort of help develop the project. So again, I see that as a sort of extraordinary bottom-up 
initiative which recognizes the importance of the physical in terms of creating greater social integration. Another project which I won't go into in detail here because I'm sure that Alejandro Aravena from Elemental has spoken here and if he hasn't I hope he will soon so that many of you can hear it straight from him. Um, this is a very exciting project for housing in Chile but also other parts of um, South America and elsewhere which starts from the very very simple idea. If you get a government grant today to build a housing unit that's what you build. You can build a shack like that and it's sort of occupied uh, occupies a sort of plot of that size. And he's worked out a mathematical, economic, and structural model, working with an excellent structural engineer, which for the same amount of money allows um, units of this sort to be uh, built. Now, if you consider that in most of these uh, economies, the informal, as I've said several times, is highly significant, what is really quite brilliant about this design is that it starts from the idea that you create a very, very simple base for one family who can move in there. You then build up as necessary, but you leave a lot of empty spaces there, which then over time become informally developed by the families, either to rent them out, as you find in, the, in Dharavi and Mumbai, that the second floor is always hired out to people <laughs> sort of lower down the scale, or the family extends, and they sort of uh, begin to build out the spaces there. The effect is that this is what you get. And this, again, is undoubtedly designed. I mean, this is an intelligence about thinking of how physical structure can accommodate human habitation with exactly the Hashim phrase of resilience. It's sort of a built-in system which I think can create city over time, can create community over the longer term. And happily, the president of Chile is, uh, in fact, endorsing this as a national program. So how do we get from here to London? So I now need a drink. What I've been talking about <clears throat> is the relationship between social inequality, uh, urban planning, macro scale, and environmental issues. And I think London, as mentioned before, is a city which has enormous assets, but it has still today enormous problems. And typical problems of a post-industrial city, where Susan Feinstein has written a lot about this, enormous inequalities, uh, lack of affordable housing, uh, a great potential in terms of the great, very vivacious and vibrant communities who've been moving into the city over the last years. Quite interesting that 98% of people who moved into London in the last 10 years were born not outside London but outside the UK. 98% of the population who's moved into our city uh, are from the wider Eastern European uh, uh, regions such as Latvia, Lithuania and Hungary. So this is a city which has potential, it has, um, uh, it has tensions, uh, um, and it has a physical condition which is, I think, really quite interesting, and it relates very much to its um, geographical position in Europe. There's the uh, Greater London Authority boundary, there's the River Thames that you can see getting wider and wider as it goes out towards the North Sea, and there is what we still call to in England um, the continent, uh, rather touchingly so. Um, but um, what has happened to the continent that it's become very connected suddenly to uh, the island uh, through the high-speed rail line which comes under the channel, uh, through the channel tunnel uh, and stops uh, in St. Pancras, which is a part of central London. But um, while many of you maybe even have heard of the, uh, this grand station in the center of London, you won't have heard, or many of you won't have heard yet, of a place called Stratford, and I'll be coming back to that because that's exactly where the Olympics are being located. So there's a macro scale of sort of well-connectedness or potential well-connectedness in terms of rail travel, therefore a degree of sustainability in that. There's also a vast area here, which you see in dark brown and then in yellow, of part of it ex-industrial land, which is potential for expansion and for the accommodation of new housing. So. London won the uh, 2012 Olympics in the year 2005. It wasn't expecting to win the Olympics. Everyone thought it would go to Paris. Apparently, uh, the story goes, and given what happened between Chicago and Rio, uh, it may resonate a little bit too much, but the reason uh, it didn't uh, really work for the French is because Chirac was incredibly rude to the Scandinavians uh, and said that their food was terrible, only worse than the English, so they voted for London rather than for Paris. 
and then the Greek representative pressed the wrong button. Uh, and uh, so we won by two votes. So there we go. So I don't know what happened between Rio and Madrid anyway, but uh, uh, in other words, sometimes things just happen by chance. And certainly London doesn't need the Olympics, you could say, in order to place itself in terms of uh, its status as a global city. But it certainly needs it, and I'm very happy to sort of be supportive of it and involved in it, to rebalance uh, a fundamental inequality between the poor East and the rich West. I'm simplifying enormously to, uh, in a way, save time. And the notion of the Olympics was therefore, how does one create an event which is hidden behind walls for two weeks into something which actually reconnects a part of the fabric of the city? Now, um, the Olympics uh, occupies uh, an important site, and I'll talk about it in a second, a bit more detail, on the east side of London. For those of you who don't know London, just recognize this bit of the River Thames. That's the Millennium, Millennium Dome. That's Canary Wharf, and this is called the Isle of Dogs. This dip over here becomes important. You can see large expanses of water uh, and ex-industrial land where the um, British Empire, in many ways, was built in the 18th and 19th century. Uh, the attempt is very much stealing a diagram from Rem Koolhaas, in fact, I think, to use the opportunity of um, the redevelopment of the site to <coughs> reintegrate uh, an area that has been for too long cut off from its surroundings. Most of this uh, part of London, East London, was the work base for uh, dock workers, hundreds of thousands of them over years, many of whom became unemployed in the 70s and 80s when the docks were closed because of containerization. Classic problem of major uh, port cities, uh, which you've experienced, of course, here in Boston as well. As a result of that, I think still today, one can feel the effects of this in terms of the social dynamics or the levels of deprivation that one still finds in East London. In fact, this map here in the darker colors uh, shows you where there's greater concentration of deprived families. Those are women, single women with children, uh, high unemployment, low levels of education. It's not just poverty, it's the whole thing together. And please remember that dip in the river that I described before. Okay? There's Canary Wharf and there's the Millennium Dome. And as you see, London is relatively fragmented in terms of its poverty. By the way, if you did this map to Paris, all the edges would be dark and the center would be light. Okay? The lighter color is, is wealth. And here you have pockets of wealth and a lot of it is in the west and a lot of it is not in the east. And the greatest concentration of the dark colors in this area is over here. Point number one. Point number two is transport accessibility. This map shows in purple the best areas of public transport where you can get the underground and the bus system and rail system working very well. And there you can just about see again the River Thames, I hope, over there with the Millennium Dome and that point. In red is the second next best level of accessibility. In blue is the worst. So these are sort of suburban places with hardly any public transport. Now, if you look at this map very carefully, you see that, of course, central London is purple and red, very, very well connected. Um, there are some places like Croydon, uh, down on the bottom here, which are incredibly well connected, very much a reality of the city. Uh, there's a place called Barking, and then that spot over there is this place called Stratford. Right? But elsewhere, there's hardly any good public transport around it. So if you take this map and this map, sorry, this map, no, I'm going the wrong way. This map and this map, I think you have a real urban problem, and therefore also an urban solution. So when the um, government decided that the Olympics should go somewhere, they decided, I think I have to say quite wisely, that they should go in exactly this area, which has the highest concentration of deprivation and great potential in terms of public transport. So that's what the Olympics is about when you see it at this macro scale. Forget about the two weeks of the games. Think about it as a 20, 30 year project, which I hope could and will rebalance London. What is also important, and there's again that little blip in the River Thames, is that separately to all this, there's a major investment, partly government and partly, partly private sector, of creating a new high-speed 
metropolitan rail line which connects the east to the west with something called crossrail. It's a bit like the Parisian uh, RER uh, system, where from Heathrow you can actually get in about 25, 30 minutes all the way to uh, Canary Wharf and then it connects up to Stansted Airport. Now, the area that uh, the Olympics um, is happening has a very, very mixed quality to it. At one level, you can sort of be quite extreme and say it has the sort of uh, car bashers, uh, London sort of gangster territory, which it is, which of course is a very important part of the city I I itself. It's not that uh, that doesn't have any quality to it at all. Uh, and of course, all of this has been wiped out, and this is a picture taken, in fact, three weeks ago uh, of the site as it is now. You, what you can already see is um, the stadium uh, completed. I'll come back to that. This is the beginning of the uh, Olympic Village, one of uh, the 12 uh, residential blocks being built over here. Right in the middle is uh, the new uh, ra railway station that connects you uh, to Paris on one side. And over there you see the city of London, our financial center, which actually begins to look closer and closer as you uh, look at it, which is really quite uh, intriguing. So the site has this sort of mixed industrial quality around it. It's over there, and it's part of a very, very interesting system of greenery and water, which connects um, the Lee Valley, as this is called, this green valley over here, uh, winding its way down these canals to the River Thames over here. But what it doesn't do at all even before any of the work started, is connect east and west. Now, what is important here is to understand the social makeup of this area to then describe the project and, uh, in a way, complete the description. This is an area which is very mixed, very typically mixed of London. In this area here, you have waves of three or four different generations of Asian immigrants who've come in and are relatively successful. Uh, the girls, particularly teenage girls of the Asian families over here, perform better at schools than the average of London because they're motivated and they want to move on in life. In Stratford uh, Town Centre, which is over here, uh, you have a large black community, uh, very, relatively stable, um, but a typical sort of town centre of London. On the other side, in Hackney, you have a mixture. You have some white unemployed, so still part of the, uh, in a way, the effects of the closure of the docks who live in some of the housing estates in this area. Some of the highest right-wing votes, British National Party votes, happen in some of these areas over here and further to the east. And on the top left-hand corner, you have uh, some loft buildings which are now being inhabited by artists. There's the greatest concentration of artists in Europe in this area. So it's a classic mixed sort of uh, um, uh, map, of, which is very, very typical for those of us who live in London. So the site becomes an opportunity to either connect or not. It's that simple an issue, and I think the design agenda is ultimately about that. It's a large site. It's twice as big as Venice, if you compare it. And uh, one of the first things that was done was to invest 300 million pounds of the 9.3 billion, which is roughly $12 billion, $13 billion today, the first 300 uh, million pounds of that 450 billion, million dollars was used to remove these overhead uh, electrical uh, pylons and put them in an underground tunnel so that the land could be developed for housing and for playing areas and for the mix of uses which I will be describing. Uh, the scheme was one, um, the, sorry, the competition scheme was one in a very exciting uh, proposal which had foreign office architects in the lead um, and I have to say, probably now it's less exciting because reality has sort of hit in. But some of the key ideas are still there. But at the heart of the uh, plan was one very important concept. The Olympics is about introducing sports to uh, one city for two weeks, uh, most of which, most of the sports, have absolutely nothing to do with the city that hosts it. Right? We don't do basketball, you do. Right? We have to build a, a 6,000 seat basketball auditorium, which if we left it there, no one would ever use again. Right? Let's start with that. Hockey, same sort of thing. Taekwondo, not that many people in London do Taekwondo. Right? Uh, we are quite good, apparently, at cycling, uh, and um, uh, rather good or hopeful for swimming, and there isn't an Olympic pool. So, the whole Games is predicated around building this Olympic park, 
with uh, 17 or 18 different um, uh, sports facilities, the Olympic Village and a park at the center of it, but only four of the venues remain. All the others are designed to be taken away, either dismantled or literally relocated. So in other words, you don't leave the site as a, white, a series of white elephants as Athens is today. You actually take away the buildings and you leave where the footprint was a site for development which has been cleaned from pollution, has good infrastructure, uh, and becomes the basis of uh, future development. So this diagram here summarizes it. That's how the games is being thought about, a development site with lots of venues and you only keep the ones you actually need, and then the empty spaces become urban development. And in fact, a close friend of ours and of, who also taught us at GSD, um, Andy Altman, who was the chief planner of Washington and deputy mayor of Philadelphia until three months ago, is now in charge of this redevelopment project. Now, uh, this slide probably doesn't allow you to see too much, but that's, that's, uh, we don't need to go into much detail. But the only four buildings which remain are the major stadium, but I'll describe that in a moment, Zaha Hadid's aquatic center, uh, a velodrome over there, and a sports facility uh, over there. All the other ones that you see dotted around are removed. And once those are removed in the next 20, 30, 40, 50 years, we don't know how long it's going to take, particularly when you have recessions as we've had over the last months, all the sites where you see the buildings removed become an opportunity for city. So this is the plan. This is the long-term plan which, of course, if it works, then allows connections and routes to the public spaces, including the major public park, to all the communities to the south, <coughs> to the west, and importantly to the east, as I described before, to, in a way, make this uh, hopefully a sort of seamless part of London. That's the ambition. Uh, that's all, all I can say. It's not perfect by any means, and certainly not made perfect by the fact that there's a massive shopping center uh, which is under construction right here with 5,000 parking spaces. But that's the dynamics of a city like London, like many other uh, cities that we know of. A building like this, which is the basketball center, as I say, will be uh, uh, removed and probably sent to Glasgow where they will have the Commonwealth Games. That's a sustainable way of thinking about these things. We've built one or two, I think, rather nice buildings. This is by a young group of architects called Nord. It's a smaller energy center. This is by John McCaslam. Um, the building that will remain is the velodrome by Michael Hopkins and partners. And even Zaha Hadid's aquatic center, which is going to many ways be the jewel in the crown, has been designed to operate in two modes. Swimming is a great attraction during the Olympics, and it needs 17,000 seats. Normal swimming events, not during the Olympics, maximum will attract 5,000 people, right? So she's designed it for 5,000 people. During the games, they stick these two not very elegant arms on the outside for the extra seating, but then they're taken away again, and this is what the building will be afterwards. And the same happens uh, for the stadium itself. This is by HOK Sports, and the idea is relatively simple. London has a major uh, stadium, it's called Wembley Stadium for 90,000 seats. We don't need another one. We'll never use it again with 80,000 plus. So the whole of the stadium has been designed so that there are 55,000 seats from the ground up and 25,000 from the ground down. After the games, the 55,000 seats get taken down. We were hoping we were selling them to Chicago. Well, that's not going to work. <laughs> that's unfortunate. But as you see, everything from the ground up is actually dismantled. And what remains is a much smaller stadium which can be used by a local club, local football club, or, or for local sports event. And in that sense, it also allows the city to actually begin to come round. So if I were to conclude what the strength of this project is, and I say I'm not trying to sell it as an architect or uh, in, in terms of the quality of the design, but maybe the intelligence of thinking of design at this both macro level and micro level, um, is that it's recognizing the fact that from the year 2007 when the work really started in a site which had poor connections, the occasion for, of the 2012 means that there are more routes, more connectivities, more potential for urbanity and complexity. And if over time, when real estate development actually begins to come into the land owned by the mayor of London, as it happens, uh, and will be sold uh, against the master plan, which has to be agreed with all the principles that I've been describing, there is the potential, that's all I can say, the potential of making cities. 
So from something like this, we might end up with a sort of hotspot, which, if you half close your eyes, feels a bit like the rest of London. So I can only conclude by saying that I think design does matter, and I think we need to, as architects and as urban designers, both raise our height, our sights in terms of the scale of the issues we're talking about. We can't forget the sort of statistics that I used at the beginning about the percentage of people actually living in cities, but the fact that you know, a third of the urban world is living in disgraceful poverty and 75% of the uh, urban environments causes potential uh, damage. But I hope that by talking about design in this wider sense, I leave you with a sense of optimism that design matters in making the cities of the world more sustainable. Thank you very much. Maybe more than a couple. So uh, please. Okay. Thank you, first of all, for a very multi dimensional talk that I think addresses the physical and non physical forces that are largely not addressed in discourse today about sustainability and urbanism. They're quite often focused on energy or focused on theory or focused on one thing or another rather than addressing um, the multiplicity of forces at play. But what I want to ask you about is the nature of academia that is educating the future professionals who will be responding to these multidimensional forces. Because really, we, you know, we need to be able to speak and understand and, and respond to our understanding creatively about, um, about economics, about art, about uh, qualitative research and quantitative research and poverty and energy and environment, so many different forces that we we can't respond to as designers unless, personally, I believe we have a full understanding of all of them. Yet the nature of academia is so compartmentalized in terms of, you, 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 can, you can do a design degree and have a somewhat, <laughs> you can have a somewhat solid understanding of socioeconomic forces or you can do a political degree and have some understanding of how you might respond creatively. So where, where, what is the future of, of degree programs that might be able to allow us to become more of renaissance women and men. <laughs> you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, you're fortunate that at least you're in a uh, graduate school of design that recognizes that these issues are there. I would agree with you that 95% you know, of schools of architecture, schools of planning work in silos. And, and, and I think that that is um, problematic. Uh, I'm, I'm, speak, I'm slightly biased because I was able uh, to start 12 years ago at the London School of Economics, a place which normally trains uh, civic leaders and uh, uh, mayors and uh, foreign ministers uh, to uh, excel in their skills, uh, to actually be able to start a tiny program and sort of master's program where some of those people who go on to become civic leaders uh, or developers for that matter, public or private clients, at least un begin to understand these issues. We actually had a studio which included um, people from a legal or political uh, background working with architects who were interested in understanding the other side of the fence. Um, all I can say is that the only way to do this is a radical rethinking which cuts across the disciplines uh, um, in a horizontal way. Some of the major problems are not the educational establishments, but the design professional bodies. I remember being asked, <clears throat> wouldn't it be good if my course, as it was then, called the Master of City Design and Social Science, got recognition from the Royal Institute of British Architects? I said that would kill it immediately, because I'd have to do things to accredit uh, the, the course in the ways that the profession wants them to be done. So, so I, you know, the, the answer to your question is that in the, there, there are structures, there are new ways of teaching uh, that uh, can allow that. I think not only at the sort of the basic level of sort of uh, undergraduate and postgraduate teaching, but also through um, working with people in power now or the generation that is going to be in power very soon with sort of short courses, summer programs, uh, executive training, uh, programs where you know some of these issues 
are just put on the table over two, three weeks, and you look at case studies of cities that work, or as Tony Williams is going to be teaching here, cities that fail. You know, how, how do you mess up a city? You know, ask him. Um, it, uh, you know, I don't, I don't mean it that way. Um, <clears throat> No, but th there are things you can do wrong in terms of financial investment, land ownership issues, uh, let alone design. So, I mean, you know, you are sitting in a school where you, you've had deans who've been looking at this uh, and I think really changing the, the, the way the thinking happens, but it's a it's, it's tiny percentage of what happens. I think those who do real estate um, should be connected to this discussion. Uh, because let's remind ourselves that probably 90% of the built fabric, well, probably you can't say this in Cambridge, but you can say it in Boston, 90% uh, is built by private developers who have an interest in having a financial return. 95% of what's being built in uh, South America, uh, Africa, and elsewhere is also private. And I think the investor, call it a real estate developer, or the, or, or the private client, is has to be part of uh, this game. Otherwise, you end up with the right-hand side of the very first slide of Caracas. No, I, it would be good if you take the microphone, because I can't hear well. Uh, change of accent, and uh, great to see some shots of my home city, London. Um, Ricky, I wanted to move on to a question. You talked about social, environmental, political factors all affecting design. Great to hear that as a part of the agenda that we all know everyone involved in physical um, uh, change needs to encompass. I wanted to ask about your thoughts on the cost of design. And perhaps the follow-on from the question, does design matter, is does good design cost more? And I just, in my mind, I'm thinking about the move towards life cycle costing. It's great we're moving to that, and, and, and over the long term, we know that has benefits. But if a o building owner sells on his building, he doesn't necessarily see things that way. And we're back to what is the capital cost to start with. And perhaps another part of the whole agenda is convincing developers, politicians, everyone else involved that you know, good design doesn't need to cost more. Well, I, I think it's, a, it's nearly a relative relatively easy answer. I mean, I, I think um, the sorts of design solutions that I've, in a way, been illustrating, um, the notions of buildings or urban forms which uh, maximize flexibility or resilience, again, to use that word, are uh, probably the most cheap solutions that you can find. Uh, the, in other words, it's not designing buildings which are uh, uh, just fit one activity specially made for uh, a period of time or a particular function. The notion of a sort of, you know, uh, loose fit uh, structure, you know, language which is now coming back into fashion, where you have both a uh, sort of an open grid of a city and an open grid of a, a, a built form, uh, which is shallow, maximum of 17 meters, because then you can actually have domestic uh, adaptation to sort of commercial uses. Uh, which have high ceiling heights and, and not sort of filled with stuff that you can't get rid of. That sort of typology, both in urban terms or in built form terms, uh, I think certainly need not be more expensive in order to create that flexibility. So I, I, I would think in that sense, oddly, for once, it might be a win-win situation with uh, the need to economize leading to, in fact, more rather than less flexible solutions. Would you agree? Well, when you were describing the buildings that are going to be built at great expense and then torn down at the London Olympics site. Uh, it sort of makes me think, well, gee, we could have spent that money on building things like schools that wouldn't be torn down. So I know that the justification for the Olympics in London or uh, the failed New York bid is always, well, if we didn't have the Olympics, we wouldn't have the impetus to do all this other stuff uh, that should be done but somehow can only get done if you're going to have an Olympics, something I don't quite understand, but seems to be the case. Uh, but I wonder if you'd comment on Rio and whether you think it's really appropriate uh, that uh, a city which has such vast slums uh, 
uh, should in fact be spending such 